tibial shaft fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series version 5. These are slides by Dr. Stephen Quinnen and Erica Garbrecht, and I'm Saqib Rahman narrating. So the objectives are to describe the epidemiology and evaluation of tibia shaft fractures, compare treatment options, discuss outcomes and complications. So this is the most common long bone fracture uh, with a somewhat high incidence of being open, 12 to 47 percent. Uh, it is a very subcutaneous bone, especially along the medial border, so very frequently will be open when fractured, you know, more often than others. Uh, and if, like many um, other fractures, we see there's a bimodal distribution with uh, high energy younger patients and then somewhat older patients with lower energy spiral fractures. Vehicular trauma is the most common cause of those high energy fractures. So evaluation starts with a history and physical exam. Uh, if you have a high suspicion for a fracture, you get radiographs, orthogonal views, full length uh, tibia and fibula, and then uh, possibly joint above and joint below if you see a fracture. Uh, sometimes CT scans are needed, especially for distal third fractures, especially distal third spiral fractures, uh, and um, when indicated, vascular studies may be needed. On history, you want to get an idea of the mechanism of injuries at high energy versus low energy, uh, isolated versus polytrauma, and then their past medical history. So on the physical exam, you certainly want to uh, identify is it open versus closed on inspection. Um, what, uh, you know, is there pain like and is there pain with passive stretch, for example? How's there swelling? Or you have concern for compartment syndrome? Uh, you want to get a sense of the soft tissue injury, obviously, if it's open, uh, but even if it's closed. Uh, vascular exam, neurologic exam is very important, and also tying back to your assessment to make sure you're not missing a compartment syndrome. When you initially see the patients, um, you know, you may just get these spot shots with the limb externally rotated or somewhat deformed, maybe not splinted yet. So it's really good, like I mentioned, to get good orthogonal views of the full tibia and fibula. And then a joint above and joint below if you identify a fracture. Uh, and um, sometimes we will see distal fibula fractures. Occasionally you will see posterior malleolus fractures or uh, syndesmotic injuries. So CT scans can definitely help to uh, identify adjacent articular fractures, such as is shown here. There can be a high percentage of associated posterior malleolar fractures, and you see this pretty frequently with distal third spiral fractures of the tibia, and you may not really identify them on plain x-rays. Um, and this may uh, push you to... Uh, do uh, internal fixation of those fractures um, in order to prevent uh, nail migration and leak displacement. So vascular uh, injuries uh, have to be considered as well. Uh, if you have con uh, concern for distal perfusion despite reduction, like a lot of times when the fracture is not reduced and it's deformed and they don't have a good pulse, and you, know, you first got to straighten the leg out, get the fracture reduced, and then reassess. Uh, but if you still have a problem, you may need to consider, you know, getting ABIs, CT angiogram, or possible formal angiogram. So compartment syndrome. You can't uh, discuss tibia fractures without talking about it. Um, these will be more common with higher energy injuries, but don't necessarily have to be high energy. Um, in an awake, cooperative patient you can c communicate with, it's a clinical diagnosis of pain out of proportion, and then when you start to get a little bit further down the line, and I would argue that if you get to these points, you may be getting a little bit too late, pallor, paresthesia, and then certainly pulselessness and paralysis. Uh, those are sort of the natural history late findings of compartment syndrome. So um, you want to get to it certainly before there's uh, a foot drop and loss of pulses. So in an intubated or obtunded patient, uh, you can't really do some of that. So you may need to measure compartment pressures uh, with an intracompartmental pressure monitor. Um, and if you have uh, an awake patient and you have somewhat conflicting exam or um, difficulty uh, making the diagnosis, um, then uh, you may need to get compartment pressures also. There's a separate uh, lecture on compartment syndrome. So... 
Uh, other injuries to consider, ankle injuries, a floating knee when you have a tibia and femur fracture. Uh, occasionally, you can have associated ligamentous injury of the knee. Uh, you can have a uh, proximal tib-fib dislocation. Uh, if you look at this x-ray, uh, you'll see the tibia shaft fracture and a previous ankle injury. But if you look proximally, there is a tibial plateau fracture. Uh, I suspect a rim avulsion uh, injury as well. Uh, indicating poss possible knee ligamentous injury. So these are associated injuries. Now classification, uh, you can use AOOTA. Um, you know, it's a universal classification, so it's based on fracture morphology. So the tibia is bone number four, and then the tibia shaft would be uh, 42. Uh, and then you have A, B, and C, kind of like shown here. And of course, is the fine print, which won't go through all of those here. Um, and it doesn't really take into account if it's open or closed. Castillo classification is used pretty frequently, um, pretty universally, I would say, amongst orthopedic surgeons, amongst emergency medicine and trauma surgeons, and those of us who have to interact and communicate about these injuries. So you really do need to know it, type 1, 2, 3, and then the 3s are split up into 3A, 3B, and 3C. As outlined here, I won't go through them one by one, but that's a classification you should certainly be familiar with. Now, Cherney classification is for closed fractures. Um, this can help to identify if you have um, a mild soft tissue injury versus something where you're very worried about compartment syndrome, for example. Uh, and that actually starts with a zero. Okay, so zero, one, two, and three. So treatment options, uh, non-operative, intramedullary nailing, pleat fixation, X-fix. Uh, it so happens that uh, in this modern day and age, locked intramedullary nailing tends to be the mainstay of treatment in adults. Um, although specific injury characteristics, severity, associated injuries may necessitate alternative treatment options. Um, and we'll go through those also. So for non-operative management, relative indications are that you can have adequate alignment and length in a splinter cast, and the soft tissues can tolerate a cast, meaning uh, you don't want to have a bad soft tissue injury or blisters, for example, that you need to do wound care um, and then put them in a cast. Um, maybe a patient who is um, particularly high risk to go to surgery um, for their medical comorbidities or a patient simply refuses operative management and says, listen, I really don't want you to stick anything in my leg. Just uh, can we treat this with a cast? And that may be a starting point to decide if you meet um, other non-operative indications. So angulation is one of those, right? So um, whether you have uh, five degrees of varus or valgus, five to 10 degrees apex anterior posterior, and then zero to 10 degrees of rotation and uh, generally a centimeter or less of shortening. So um, these are sort of the traditional uh, parameters. This is what you'll see in all the textbooks. Um, but it is important to evaluate, uh, you know, overall total deformity. And um, we really don't accept too much shortening nowadays, unless you have a condition where there's bone loss and you're trying to just get healing in a short amount of a small amount of shortening may be accepted. So if you're going to treat non-surgically, uh, you can initially treat with close reduction, splinting, and then convert to a well-molded long leg um, cast. Um, oftentimes, if you really want to get a good reduction, you might have to do conscious sedation. Um, so casting acutely in the emergency department can be somewhat risky. Uh, it can be done, but there's a risk if they swell and get compartment syndrome uh, that this will be a sort of um, circumferential um, obstruction to, to allow swelling to take place. So sometimes initial splinting may be better. Um, you will need to watch these closely. So let's say you splint the patient, you know, they come back to clinic um, or they, they get admitted, uh, watch for compartment syndrome, uh, and then um, you uh, send them to clinic or you cast them at that point uh, before leaving the hospital. Um, you will need to watch them closely. So they'll have to come back in a week um, for examination, radi uh, serial radiographs, 
Uh, these can be transitioned to a patellar tendon bearing cast as shown below or a functional fracture brace at two to four weeks. Uh, Dr. Sarmiento had a very large series of patients uh, with very low non-union rates treated with functional fracture bracing with um, some shortening, um, but uh, overall uh, reasonably functional results um, and uh, difficult to replicate. More recent randomized control trials have favored operative management um, for um, improved uh, radiographic and functional um, outcomes. So we're going to pause here, and in the next uh, video, we're going to pick up and talk about uh, intramedullary nailing at length.